Welcome. <laughs> Okay, are we ready? Okay. My name is Emily. I'm a senior at Logan. My name is Ellie, and I'm also a senior at Logan. Uh, this morning, we have Chad Dahl here from Minnesota State College Southeast to present on poverty-informed practice. Chad Dahl is a passionate advocate for people in the crisis of poverty and for the value of post-secondary education in creating social mobility. He currently serves as the Vice President of Academics at Minnesota State College Southeast in Winona and Red Wing, Minnesota. Chad is a certified poverty coach through communication across barriers and writes podcasts regularly about poverty-informed practice in higher education. Please welcome Mr. Chad Dahl. All right, well, thank you very much, ladies. It's a couple of Logan Rangers, which is a school near and dear to my heart. Both my daughter just graduated last year, and my son is a freshman and going through the uh, crisis of, for anybody who's Logan-based, there's a humanities course that they throw bright freshmen into, and then some kids, like my son, uh, get a speech at the end of first quarter about how much better the class goes if you turn things in. So thank you to uh, Mr. Martin and Mrs. Kramer for explaining that to him, because our conversation this weekend was, Please don't take me out of that class, so, uh, which is not a phrase he's ever uttered before. Um, so as my uh, host said, I'm Chad Dull. Um, while I work just across the river in a college, by the way, that is close enough for students from La Crosse to all go to, um, I live here in La Crosse uh, and spent the prior 17 years working at Western Technical College, and I get about 45 minutes today to tell you about my life's work. Um, I don't have a lot of time to credential myself. Uh, so I'll give you the quick version. I've uh, been interested in the intersection of poverty and education pretty much uh, since forever. Uh, but professionally, probably the last 14 or 15 years. Um, and so I have some of the certifications they mentioned. I did a lot of work with Dr. Ruby Payne's group. Um, if somebody wants to talk offline about the uh, strengths and weaknesses of Dr. Payne's work, I'd be glad to do that. Um, I have done a lot of work in the last couple of years with Dr. Donna Beagle and her Communication Across Barriers group, uh, which I would strongly recommend. We're actually my old friends at Western and my new friends in Winona and Red Wing and the Seven Rivers Alliance were talking about maybe doing uh, Dr. Beagle's opportunity community model, but we're, we're a ways away from doing that. But my real qualification is that I'm, I'm a poor kid. Uh, now, not anymore, right? I'm 49. Uh, but I was a poor kid, and that matters, and it still matters today. And I'm going to spend some time today trying to help you understand why that matters uh, and talk a little bit about how do we move from just awareness of that mattering to doing things differently. Um, yeah, and I'll, 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 I'm just going to jump in, in there. So about two years ago, um, I went into a, an important meeting at my former employer and made the case for being the first trauma-informed and poverty-informed college that I knew of. Um, and I thought it went really well, and then the most important person in the room said to me at the end, you're going to have to talk more to me about this poverty-informed thing. I don't really get what that is. And my heart kind of sunk. Um, but it was probably the most important moment in my career. Because instead of retreating and deciding, well, they just don't get it. I got over they and decided to be they. Um, I can tell you by the time I left Western, uh, well, I guess I gave away where the meeting was. Um, we won't tell you who it was with. Uh, who, yeah. The words poverty informed are in their strategic plan. Right? Um, at my new college, we are discussing building a poverty informed infrastructure because that's who we serve. And we're talking about making a shift to embracing that. That's who I've served my whole career. That's who a lot of you serve. And what if we decided that that was awesome? Because I'll tell you what happens if we don't. This is what's at stake. Uh, for those of you that don't, you know, I don't do too many definitions today. Generational poverty means poverty is your family experience for two generations or more. Dr. Beagle shares this stat wherever she goes. I sell malpractice, right? 
What do we tell young people? The way out is education. Right? We tell them over and over and over again. And the world has changed. So 40 years ago when my dad graduated high school, about half his tiny little class from North Crawford moved to Janesville. Do we know why? Amen. GM, I heard a couple people say, you could go down and you could get a family supporting job with a high school education. Those jobs are gone. We are in a post-secondary education for all environment, and yet, if we do business as usual, one in 10. Sometimes you wonder why kids look at you like you're lying to them, because we are. So that's what's at stake if we don't do things differently. By the way, that number for a foster child, 3%. Right? So that's why this stuff's important. This is why I talk about it all the time. And this is why we have to move past awareness. I think people are aware. Right? We know. We know that it matters. We have to get less fearful and do some things. So th in some ways, that's a freeing number. How much worse could we do, right? Let's do something. So that's kind of been my, my pitch. A couple of things just to give you some background. Uh, this has been my line for a year and a half. How many educators in the room? Most all of y'all. By the way, everybody's an educator at some level. But um, we should get uncomfortable, right? Uh, especially in the last two years of my life, I have given up much of the professional distance that I used to give myself. I have lost words like enable. Well, I can't enable so-and-so. Eh. You know, sometimes enable and help live pretty close to each other. I, I just heard your keynote speaker talk about equity, right? What if getting someone what they need is just hard, so we call it enabling? So I'm encouraging you for the 45 minutes we're here and hopefully beyond to get uncomfortable, right? To get uncomfortable because you work in a business where you sell young people that they should come to me even though now you know that if we don't all do something different, we just said roll the dice, go for a 1 in 10 shot. Aren't I a lot of fun? That's all right. There's stuff we can do. Let's just do a brief background. I want you to understand the fundamental disconnect between education and serving folks in the crisis of poverty. Uh, this is an activity you could do in your classroom tomorrow for those of you that teach. Ask your students to visually represent how they spend their time. Uh, this is a group of students, adult students in Ohio, and this has been replicated consistently, but when they visually represent how they spend their time, there's lots of things that look familiar. Uh, and these are folks in poverty. They worry about jobs and money. They worry about family and friends. They worry about their children. They worry about food and housing. They worry about this thing called agency time, which does not pop up when we do a middle class life. Who knows what agency time is? Somebody want to be brave? Take it. Yes. She said, is that the time that you spend going to get services and in offices. Bingo. We love to tell people there's a program for that. Oh, no, there's a program for that. We got help. And now maybe not here in La Crosse where I live, but I'll bet all of those places have separate intake and require an appointment in a culture that struggles with time management because they're overwhelmed by the tyranny of the moment, and then we reinforce, why don't folks show up? Why don't folks? So talk to poor folks, and they'll talk to you about agency time. And for those of you that work in agencies, it's not on the chart, but they'll talk to you about how it feels. Right? How it feels to have to go ask for help. Uh, I know there's some education students in here because a couple of my former student athletes are here. Um, so you guys should remember, the Brazilian scholar Paulo Freire, I just like to say that because it sounds, makes me sound smart, um, explored America in the 1800s. And he said, we were a very unique country because we blame poor people for being poor. And they, in turn, blame themselves. 
So think about that. If that's in deep, that your circumstances are your fault, how does it feel to ask for help? So these are the students we serve. By the way, if you work in a community college like mine, it's more than 50% of students. Uh, if we use the Alice numbers, you know, asset limited, income constrained, employed, uh, we're 60, 70% of our students are struggling financially. And we operate in a middle class model that is centered on that word achievement. On the prior slide, because I forgot to tell you, look at relationships sitting in the middle. Right? Relate, and it's at the middle because that's how folks operate. It's kind of beautiful, actually. Right? It's an interconnected group. That's how you survive. Um, but when you translate that to a middle class environment, or if you don't like that word achievement because people get wiggy about that, um, just put the word goals in there. And for most of you who live in a middle class world, boy, we talk about goals. Right? Now, it's interesting. Around the outside, folks care about the same things. Middle class folks care about their children. Uh, they don't worry so much about jobs. They think about careers. They have time for hobbies and interests, in theory. Um, family and friends are universal. Oh, yeah, and for lots of us are public employees. Uh, no one likes to talk about retirement more than public employees. Right? I, can, I've, I've, I started at Western Technical College when I was 31. I felt like I was in a 15-year retirement seminar. Well, if I go at 55, how will I manage, manage health insurance? But boy, I'd really like to do something different. And I'm just going to work at Kmart. Because then I just don't have to use my brain. And when I go home at night, I punch out. And wouldn't that be awesome? Um, still have those conversations. We do those in Minnesota, too. But um, most of us would be bored to death working like that, by the way. But this is the mismatch. We sell delayed gratification. We tell young people this all the time. Give us some time, and we'll change your life. And we serve people who live in the tyranny of the moment, trying to figure out how to get to tomorrow. I promise I'm getting to the good news. But you need to recognize this. And you need to recognize that the behaviors, especially if you don't have any lived experience in poverty, that make no sense to you, make perfect sense in their context. Actually, I just tweeted it out. I love that the, the speaker said, content knowledge and context knowledge. Poverty is a context. Not a flaw, a context. And when you're relationship-based, you do things that don't always make sense to middle-class people. Very quick example, because I know time is limited today, but there was a student in my prior life who I was very close to. Came to Western to go through our alternative high school, took a couple of cracks at it, got him through. Um, because I have some boundary issues, he sold me some Cutco knives. I have a $50 paring knife that sits at my house to this day, because... I'm sure they're great. Um, but he went on. He was going to go to school at Western, and he was a little messed up on financial aid because that happens when you don't have anyone around you to help you with those things. So I floated him some money to uh, buy his books, uh, and it was going great. Uh, and by the way, he insisted on writing me an IOU. I said, you know, don't sweat it, right? It's a couple hundred bucks. I'm lucky. Nope. I absolutely, it's, I still have the letter. Four weeks into the term, the young man disappears. Gone can't find him. He was doing okay. Three weeks later, I see him on campus, and I'm not going to say his name because some of you might know him. Um, I said, where have you been? Where have you been? He said, my mom was sick. She lives in Milwaukee. I went, to go, I went to take care of her. In his context, that made total sense, right? And all my middle class rules came crashing in. Uh, did you tell someone? Did you talk to the student services people? Did you make an arrangement with your instructors? My mom was sick. I went home to take care of her. Right? That's the connect, right? And, and again, I, I really want to emphasize to you that in some ways, his way of looking at the world is better. Right? Because um, we, we still blame poor folks for being poor, and we love because we all work in like-minded institutions, we start to decide that the way we think is the right way to think. And it's not. It's just the way we've agreed to think. Um, there's certain words I never use outside of these presentations. The biggest one is common sense. If you want a couple takeaways today, one, I know there's teachers in the room, so you can do this circle activity. You could do it tomorrow, and your students will give you information that you do not have. But I'd ask you to stop using the words common sense. Uh, 
If you're an English teacher in the room, you'll be proud of me because I have learned that you should say common to whom. All right, thank you. There's at least two English teachers that understand that. Um, I had to check with a couple of them. Common sense is just a, a bunch of rules that we agreed on that make us smart and people who don't know them dumb. Right? Dr. Payne calls them hidden rules. We set up hidden rules which are landmines for people all the time. And if you think breaking hidden rules doesn't matter, break some of them. Here's my sociological experiment I run once a year. I just did it two weeks ago in Utah. Everybody knows the hidden rules of elevators. Right? If we had more time, we'd list them, but you all know. We shuffle to the back, we keep our eyes forward. I did have somebody say once, uh, don't fart. Uh, I don't know, but um, my son would violate that. But um, Poor Cameron, <laughs> if they knew how much I talk about them. But um, anyway, but we all know them, even though they're not in any book. Once a year, I go into a very crowded elevator, usually at a concert or a conference. I enter, I face the back, and I go, hey! Right? People literally back up, <laughs> right? And that you can watch the wheels turn. Oh, he's drunk. Th th this year it was 9 in the morning, so we were pretty safe. Oh, he's got a mental health issue, right? But I'd broken the hidden rule, and now our chances of having a relationship, actually, I've never said it that way before. I'm not sure we want to have a relationship in the elevator, but, um, but our chances of connecting are very low. Right? So when we decide what's common sense and what's not, we start to put up barriers. So let's keep rolling. Uh, I have come up with this idea, not on my own, but just this is my summary of lots of work that's out there. At my prior institution and at my current institution, we have four principles of poverty and foreign practice. I'm going to read them to you because it violates my PowerPoint rules, but I think they matter. So poverty and foreign practice is a mindset. It's a way of thinking that allows us to stand in awe of our students who face the impacts of poverty daily and choose college anyway. Right? Those of you in K-12, you've got, you know, they got to be there, even though they don't. Our folks are there, and really, you'd be surprised how often we kind of go, oh, they're not ready. So we talk all the time about what if we said, it's amazing. It's amazing that you chose to be here today. It's a form of first choice service which acknowledges the audacious courage it takes to pursue education when even your basic needs are tenuous. 52% of post-secondary students in Minnesota have experienced food insecurity or housing insecurity in the last year. 18% have been homeless in the last year. And they're still coming. Now, there's two reactions that I've seen to that. One of them is useless. That's the one that goes like this. Oh. That's so sad. I feel so bad for them. Well, that's fine. Get over it. Because they picked us. Right? The useful reaction is, how do we get student ready? How do we decide that we're ready for them? Because the world has changed. You all are telling them, you got to go. Post-secondary for all. And we're saying, you got to come. Then we need to not pretend that there's something or in some other situation than the one they're in. Poverty-informed practice is a commitment to reducing barriers for students so they can use their education to change their economic reality. It's not complicated. It's just hard. If you want to know what gets in students' way, ask them. By the way, we in academia love to pretend we need more tutoring. We need innovative curriculum. Eh. We need food. Right? We need stable housing. We need transportation. We need child care. So I love to talk to groups of college faculty and say, by the way, you're right. You cannot curriculum and deliver your way out of this issue. You got to keep working on that stuff, but we got to work on basic needs. And last, poverty-informed practice is an intentional choice to love the students you have. Now, I am Norwegian-German by heritage. I am from the Midwest. Uh, I barely tell my kids that I love them, although I like to think they know. Um, actually, I, one more quick story about my son. He dropped, uh, I dropped his girlfriend off the other day, and as she gets out of the car, he goes, love ya. And I go, really? Uh, <laughs> My God, you're 15. Um, but 
I, I said, did, did, you, did you say that? And he goes, are you mad because I don't say it to you? <laughs> so, no, actually, but uh, anyway. The point being that I'm encouraging you to make that same choice and to use that same word because we do things differently for people we love. We do things differently for people we love than people we like and certainly different than people we feel sorry for. Right? I love my kids. I, I, you know, don't talk to me about helicopter parents. I know too many kids that don't have anybody. I'm like a bulldozer parent. Right? I'm plowing the road. Unreasonable stuff, right? I just told you that one of my children had a little come to, you know, um, working on turning in some homework. Uh, we're all in on that. But all that help is built in, and people don't see it. But if we loved the students we serve, what would we do for them, right? By the way, this is universal. I talk to business groups, too. If you are in the service business, this changes things. Um, we had a major culture shift at my college when we got our front desk people to embrace this. Your folks who work in your offices or first point of contacts are the secret weapon for your, your people in poverty. It's the first people they see, and they have a choice. They can either go, oh my God, I come to the front desk and I answer the same question every day, or I try to change economic reality for people I love. Hard to have a bad day at work if you're doing that, right? Here's my grown-up version of work. I tell you, if you got a good job, you're going three for five, right? I don't expect to have a happy, joyful day every day, but I ought to go three for five. And when I think this way, I usually do. So that's the philosophy behind what we're doing. Let's talk about what it looks like in practice. Any administrators in the room? I see Mr. DiPaolo in the back, so he's like, that's right. Um, I'm an administrator too. Oh yeah, there's all my kids' administrators are here. So Cameron and Hannah are doing very well, thank you. Um, but <laughs> uh, I'm an administrator too, and we need to wrestle with this. Policy is a wonderful way to protect ourselves from getting hurt. Now, I get liability, I get we gotta, things have to be, but policy by definition, by definition is inequitable because policy is the same, All right? So everybody, I just laugh. I will never show you the baseball field meme because every presenter in America is doing that, but it's a nice illustration of the difference between equality and equity. But think about that. Policy is, by definition, inequitable. I have no answer to that problem. I just want you to wrestle with it. Uh, the, I, I quote these folks because I'm big on credit. If you want to see folks doing amazing work, Google Amarillo College in Amarillo, Texas, who created what they call a culture of caring and turned hard into poverty barriers. Took their graduation rates for, from 19%, which by the way is not that low compared to community colleges across the country, to 56 in five years. Uh, it's not complicated, it's just hard. So, being mindful, um, when I used to work at Western, my president was a visual management guy. He really liked pictures. I'm the least visual person on planet Earth. Uh, I'm all words all the time, so I made him a triangle. Um, for those of you uh, who are familiar with Maslow or Bloom, I apologize. This is liberally stolen from them. But this is our poverty-informed triangle. At the base, meeting basic needs, how many people have a food pantry in their building? Good. Don't stop there. I'm going to tell you why in a second. But if folks can't eat, they can't learn. They don't know where they're sleeping. It's very difficult to learn. So you need to think about, if you want to be a poverty-informed institution, what are you doing for basic needs? And you can't do it alone. Right? My friend Dr. Sarah Goldrick Rabb says over and over and over again, you don't have to be a social worker, but you better know one. Right? And some of the stuff going on in this community is fantastic that way. We're putting them right in the space. Over on the right-hand side, and I'm going to talk more about this in a second, is this idea of operating from a position of strengths. What skills does that person in front of you, have they developed just to get there? 
How do we celebrate that? How do we leverage that? What do we do to create a sense of belonging and their sense of self-efficacy? People in poverty have been getting the message their whole life that they're not supposed to be where they are, right? That they're lucky to be there. I told you, I'm 49 years old. I probably haven't been in financial crisis since I was 20 late. Um, my friends and coworkers would tell you that they can still see it. The people who know me best, there's this chip on my shoulder that comes out. Because I'm still pretty sure that you are judging me, right? And it's, it's on, on the surface, it's ridiculous, right? I'm like the quintessential middle class, middle age, slightly above middle weight, um, you know, guy. But I'm just telling you, uh, the poor kid is looking for his feelings to get hurt. How are you working in your building to make sure they know they're supposed to be there? By the way, this spreads beyond poverty. Right? We talk about this in equity work all the time. Where are the things in your school that say people like you are here? Right? And over on the other side, which we won't spend a ton of time on today, is this notion, especially at the college level, of how do we move you through faster? Right? And it happens in K-12 too. Right? We're doing um, this side of the river, my new side of the river, all kinds of dual enrollment stuff. Time is the enemy when you have nothing. Right? Because life happens. And little things that are little things to you and me are catastrophes if you don't have anything. Right? Car trouble is an annoyance for me. Car trouble when I was 25 meant I lost my job, which might in sequence mean I lost my apartment. Right? And then all of a sudden, I, you could be on the street because of a fan belt. I told you I'd talk about things you could actually do. Uh, this is work I did at Western. I had a program called Youth Build. Um, they're just finishing it up and applying for another grant where we served young uh, at-risk folks from 16 to 24, taught them building trades, and worked on uh, high school credentials and moving on to college. Great little program. Uh, the teachers in it did what teachers often do on a big day. They had a pizza party, right? Nothing, nothing better than food. One young man in the class refused to eat the pizza. I thought, okay, maybe you're like my nephew, you don't like cheese. And it was just, and, and by the way, it got kind of confrontational, right? Because teachers take it personally. I, I paid for this out of my own pocket. I'm celebrating with you. I care about you. And I pulled the young man aside uh, because we had a relationship. And I said, what's going on? And he said, I don't want my mind and body to get used to eating. He was eating two days a week. Uh, the next day, uh, I brought the big blue bowl from my house, and my family and I went shopping, and we just started putting food out. Um, it expanded, uh, but that's a, we would fill that up, by the way, in my little division at Western, about five times a day. Um, we're not sure we invented it, but we hadn't seen it anywhere else. Other colleges started copying it, and they called it grab and go. The reason I asked you about your food pantry is we gave out more food through grab and go than we did through the pantry. No matter how well designed your pantry is, because of how we are culturally, there's stigma attached. Right? And you should listen for the words around it. We have food pantries at both my campuses at my new college. I was glad they were there when I got there. But somebody who was organized goes, yeah, you can just go to the dollar store and get some stuff. I said to him, I said, well, Tom, is that what you eat? Right? Um, I will tell you, if there's any nutritionists uh, in the group, um, I did not sort for nutrition. Right? We bought things people liked. The other thing we had with the grab-and-go bowls is uh, there's no rules. I made a point of eating out of the bowl just about every day. Uh, two things happened. One, it normalized it. But more important, I talked to people. Right? I'm an administrator. If I want to, I can hide in my office all day. But these were conversations I got to have with students over food. Um, when I left Western, after a year of me and several people on campus buying most of this food, the college committed. There are seven food bowls around campus being filled by student government funds. And there's hygiene products in every bathroom. 
So that's one of the places the school district was ahead, right? I remember reading that in the paper about a year ago, or like, it's, it's just there. People will ask you stupid questions when you do stuff like this. When I put the food out, how will we make sure that only the poor people get it? Want to know my answer? I don't care. We do not build policy on 3% of people doing it differently than we want them to. Oh, this is real quick. This is just fun. Um, this is, uh, you can't read it, but I'll tell you, this is the Black River Falls campus at Western. There's an alternative high school program. There's a nice sign on the door. It's been there for a dozen years. It says, like, where's the door to your future, four-year college, two-year college, on-the-job training. And the sustainability people came through and put a sticker underneath that said, please keep door closed. The reason I share that is you need to be aware of the messages in your building. These were the kind of things we were doing at Western when we uh, woke up. We called it a no audit. Walk around your space and see how many times you tell people no. See how many times you have something that's not welcoming. By the way, we had allowed food and beverage in classrooms for 20 years. We had that sign in every classroom. Uh, we also built that building pre-internet, so it's all caps, right? Everybody understands what all caps is in the internet age? We were yelling at people. First, meeting, first thing you got when you got in there, no! Um, we had signs like this on locked doors all over the place. Because apparently we were terrified of jiggling doorknobs. <laughs> right? I mean, really, the worst case scenario is somebody's going to go, oh, it's locked. Everywhere. Right? Everywhere. Um, this is my favorite. This was on the second locked door inside another locked door in red. Uh, but because Western is an inclusive employer, it's got Braille. Uh, I don't read Braille. I'm pretty sure it says get out. Um, so again, for those of you who don't feel empowered, I just started taking them down. First, do no harm, right? But, and it, it seemed silly. But then my staff started to care. Remember those front office staff I mentioned who work really, really hard and get really, really burnt out? They came up with this. Right? They said, let's put information on there. If you can't read it in the back, instead of saying staff only, in a warmer font, it says, students, if you need help to, or to speak to an instructor, please go to the front desk and it points. It's informational. I was joking, one of those staff only signs was on a bathroom because apparently you know, we needed our own private place to do that. Um, I almost put up a sign saying, you know, you can pee here, but uh, it would. Um, here's other things we do. Anybody's organization got a lot more resources than they need? Just checking. Uh, we put stickers on stuff, ungodly amounts of stickers. Every book that came in, and I'm going to have to eventually, once I've gone from Western for a year, I'll have to probably get new stuff. But we wanted you to know that was our property. That, by the way, folks, is a GED workbook. The black market for GED workbooks is soft. Right? Dozens of hours putting stickers on these books. Right? And I want you to think about that, because we don't think about these things. So why are we doing that? Because apparently we think you're going to steal the book. Okay, let's assume that 3% of our students really, really want to steal a GED workbook. Well, we're a reading program, so that's a tragedy that they would steal a book. Right? In the process, we've told 97% of our students we think you're a thief. Remember, they're not sure they're supposed to be here anyway, and we just... We spent hours putting stickers on stickers. And I want you to picture that 3%, which is really probably 0.01% that are going to take this book, are any of them really going to slink out of the classroom with it under their coat, get to the door, and go, there's a sticker. I am ashamed. I am reborn. I will return it. So think about that. Hours of things we could be doing, things that mattered. And I'm just going to tell you, because you're going to go back and you're going to want to tear things off the walls. P 
people go nuts when you change this stuff. Four months took me. Four months. Can we just maybe stop with this chat and, and, and just not put it on future ones? Nope, we're taking them off. Well, but, but we need to, but people won't, it's fine. I said, I'll bet we spend more in man hours than we protect uh, books disappearing. But the system, it, it's a great way to see how in deep our bias is. I just want to make sure that we are on time. Okay. So when we talk about moving people more quickly, uh, that Paula Freire is the person who coined the phrase tyranny of the moment. Think about the people you serve. Think about when you ask them to long-range plan and they're not sure when dinner is or where dinner is. Think about the contrast between those things. So if you can move people towards meaningful learning more quickly, your odds go up. At the college level, that means my college now, we are looking at cutting all of our classes from 16 weeks to eight weeks. The evidence across the country is very clear. The success rates go up because there's less time for stuff to happen. Right. How do we move people towards some stability? Uh, have you guys heard the bandwidth analogy? People talk about that. You know, we understand networking and, and computers enough to know you need so much bandwidth to do your work. And if you come from my house, you arrive at school with a fair amount of bandwidth because it wasn't hard to get there that day. You got your Here Comes the Bus app. And other than me reminding you to get out of bed nine times, you're good. What about that young person in a different situation who has to solve 10 problems just to get to your door and has this much bandwidth left? How do we help them? How do we create space? By the way, one of the answers is don't have different rules in every room you go to. In my world, uh, where we teach online, one of the simplest things we fixed was Stop having a different course format for every online course. Right? By the way, people go nuts. Right? Uh, if you dealt with college faculty, right? I have academic freedom. I had a, a, someone tell me, I make my Blackboard shell, Blackboard was the, the, our learning management system, I make it complicated on purpose so they learn to problem solve. Thank you for laughing. Um, that's not the point, right? And here's the advantage you guys who are in K-12 have. And I, I never tell my college folks this, but it's just, well, actually I did, and that's why they, they get tired of me. You know how to teach, right? You understand that it begins with learning. And how you get there isn't as important. I had someone at the college level tell me when we switched from a 16-week to a 15-week semester, what am I going to do? There's 16 chapters in my book. So there's lots of room for improvement there. Please remember that everyone needs help. You all got help. It's just built in for a lot of us. Right? And we stigmatize help. I, I, they mentioned in my introduction, I write about this stuff quite a bit. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was a little kid. They were teen parents. It's a long story. But I remember in the mid-70s, my mom went back to school, and one of the ways we got by was with food stamps. I remember what they looked like because they were really stamps back then. Till the day she died, she would deny that ever happened. Right? We had huge fights about it. My mom was a very successful person, and based on the kind of work I do, I want to say, no, no, tell people it works. Never happened, Chad. It never happened. I'm like, no, it happened in 1976 and 1977 in Westby. I was there. I'm not, I don't invent things. They were this color. Um, Till the day she died. Because we have this myth of do it on your own. Last point is a new one for me. I heard a great presenter last summer. You don't have to bargain for equity. Right? And if that doesn't make sense to you, I'll give you an example because we do it all the time. When I try to tell people that you're going to get something you need, not you really, but... Um, I turn to the person who already has it and I reassure them that they're not going to lose out. You are not required to reassure those who have benefited from inequitable structures. It's the same thing I, I had my, my former college president, and he meant well, but he would say, our college serves those with bumps 
and bruises, and, the, and, and then he also, and the valedictorians. Yeah, that's great. They're fine. We don't have to reassure them, right? You don't have to bargain. You just have to talk about what's right. I, I, you know, and I, and I circle around them because it's hard, but think about the weirdness of trying to get people what they need and then reassuring folks who maybe have already arguably over-benefited that we won't harm you in doing that. It's not equity. And you shouldn't have to bargain to get what you need. So, I've got a little call to action for you. One, if you have access to students tomorrow, and then I'll get to my list, ask them what's getting in the way. They'll tell you. Uh, also, if you are someone with lived experience, start to open up a little bit. There's a whole theory of communication called identification theory. There's three levels of it. Level one is where I don't tell you anything about myself. I maintain professional distance. People don't learn from people they don't know. Level three is the one you don't want to be at, where I barf up every part, piece of my inner soul and we make it all about me. But level two is magic, where I disclose something about me. Now, maybe this will be the first day it doesn't happen because it's the first time I'm calling it out in front of a group. But any time I've done a presentation with this, at least one person will come up and tell me some of their story. Right? Because hopefully, some of this made them go, oh, I don't have to hide my story. Your students need the same thing. But here's what I'm asking you to do, if we need to save a little time for questions. I want you to default to action. I want you to default to helping. Don't be afraid, right? 11% are going to make it if we don't do something different. It's okay to break stuff, fail forward, check, and try to do better, right? Um, I always say, I, I used to argue with someone who wanted to use the airport slogan at their school, if you see something, say something. Eh, how about if you see something, do something? And if you have to give up a little of your professional distance to do that, so be it, because you're going to get to be uncomfortable. I want you to think about, uh, I borrowed this from my folks in the recovery community, do a fearless self-inventory for bias. Check yourself for hidden rules. Check for things you call common sense. If you're in a classroom and you aren't sure what these are, think about what pushes your buttons. That will start to tell you where your assumptions are. And I'm not even telling you you have to get rid of them. Not even asking that much. I'm telling you, you better surface them, right? Students shouldn't have to guess. I, I just told you that I, and I, you know, so if anybody sees my son, don't tell him we talked about this, but he just had a great conversation with a teacher who said explicitly, we like you. Thank you for starting with that. You are not doing the things it takes to succeed in this course. If you'd like to stay here, you need to do this. It was transformative. Right? It was no, no baloney. It was an adult conversation, and he came home, and I have, knock on wood, pretty good faith he's going to do better. Look for opportunities to connect, build relationships, and create solutions, not just with your students, but with each other. That's why this collaboration is so important. Have the conversation. Be fearless. And just get comfortable being uncomfortable. Our outcomes are not okay. And this work, it is the time for this work, right? Our whole cycle counts it. So there's, there's less and less young people coming through. If you're in the college, we talk about the pipeline to our employers. So for those of us, and I'm going to assume it's most of us in this room, who care about including people who have been left out, now is our time, right? There's no way for people to dodge that. So we can have these conversations. But we have to get in there, and we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable with your own stuff. So, this is me. Uh, if any of this was interesting to you and you want to connect further, uh, I write just about every week on uh, LinkedIn on various topics in a very amateur kind of way about this, mostly trying to tell my story. Uh, I also just uh, do some podcasts recently um, for anybody under the age of 40. My 
My podcasts are terrible, but they are out there. I may have pirated music in them, but no, Lou Reed's dead, so he's not coming after me yet. Um, but I would encourage you to connect. Uh, I think if there was one thing we could get done, let's change the discourse together. Let's celebrate the courage that it takes for people in poverty to come to us and ask us to help them change their reality. And to do that, we need to rely on one another because when you bump into systems that benefit from the current reality, you will get pushback. Right? And one of the things that keeps us going is knowing we're out there together. So before I wrap up, any, any questions? Yes. I was wondering your opinion on like, the basic needs. For example, if you're um, working with a student and you've built a relationship with them, you've gotten to know them really well, um, there are tons of resources out there. You find out what their needs are, and maybe those resources aren't available. I was wondering your opinion on like reaching into your own pocket to help students and where you would draw the line to not do that. It's a great question. Uh, in case you didn't hear, um, what about giving them something from yourself? Here's my official answer. Um, there's boundary issues there. Have I done it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say two things. One, if you choose to make the decision, one, make sure you're not going to get fired. Um, two, the way I always did that was I created some fake fund. Right? Uh, if students need something, let me check. Uh, I, actually, it's pretty funny. We, uh, we helped someone with a bus pass about a year ago who then chewed out the caseworker she was working with, because how come you don't know about this petty cash that Chad has? Right? <laughs> so that's my most honest answer to your question. I would encourage you structurally, keep bringing resources into your building. Right? And I know you guys are already here on the, the community school stuff is the exact right way to be headed. The more you can not send people away because there's leakage. So when I worked at Western, we are, you would think, ridiculously close to the county building. It's a long walk from Western to the county building, isn't it, Jane? <laughs> it just is. Um, so if you can bring people on site and you can do it from a relationship place, just one quick example and then I know we got to wrap up. A at Western, and it's already in place when I got to Minnesota Southeast, which is a very poverty-informed institution that you should think about sending students to, um, and applications are free this week. But, um, we invited Workforce Connections into our space. We didn't even really know what we were going to do together. But we put them in our space and, and one, all of those social service programs have enrollment requirements. They would like to serve more people. They served more people because we had them. Two, we learned about food share and employment training programs that we didn't know about. We learned more about Workforce Investment Opportunity Act funds those are the collaborations that change things, but we need to make it easy, not hard. Anyway, I appreciate the attention. Uh, it's always hard for someone to get talked at for 50 minutes, so you guys have been great. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.